Amen. We also want to welcome our Facebook congregation, YouTube, as well, when that gets uploaded. Uh, so grateful that you're a part of this with us. Uh, if you can do, do a favor for me, if you can like this and share this comment uh, or, or this post, that helps us, that helps our algorithm. Uh, also, if you could stop ghost watching, and uh, what I mean by that is there's tons of people that watch us, and if you can just push like, that helps me to pray for you and know that you were on and, and just excited about that. So don't ghost watch me today if you could do that for me. Amen. Can we just welcome our Facebook congregation that's with us today? I only laugh because that feels very TV productionist, but it, it is what it is. So, All right, so uh, today I wanted to talk about thinking like the kingdom. I was brought to a parable uh, at Matthew, the 20th chapter, and it, it kind of challenges the way I think. Now, I've read this parable before, but in all actuality, I still struggle with it because it's not how I was raised. It's not a natural response for me. And so it, it takes me back, and I, and I have to say, God, I need to think like you think, right? Have you ever thought a certain way and then found out you were completely wrong in it? Like you thought you were right, but... So an example of this for me is um, uh, when I was in Germany, there was... I had a best friend over there. He was a helicopter pilot, tall, really good looking dude, like, looked like uh, ben, uh, ben Affleck. Is that, he's, is that the right name? I, I always struggle with that because Affleck, I think of the insurance, but... But Ben Affleck, uh, you know, the guy that's friends with Matt Damon, that guy. Anyway, but Ben Affleck, he looked like him, helicopter pilot, like amazing. And it, we were in Germany, and he liked this girl that was kind of cute. He's like, man, you think, you think she'd date me? And I was like, dude, come on, man. You, you checking all the block boxes, man. You like Top Gun. Like, of course she's going to date you. And, and so I was encouraging him to hit on her and ask her out on a date. And we show up to like a, a, one of those like little gatherings, single gatherings. And she, she had another date with her. And he's like, what, what's up with, like, you think she's into him? And I was like, no, dude. Like he's old and fat and bald. There's no way. I'm just, I'm just telling you what I thought at the moment. Like why you got to judge me? No, but... So I said that to him. I was like, oh, dude, you got this. And I would find out later how wrong my thinking was because that was Marlo, and I ended up being married to her. <laughs> yeah. So I asked Marlo. I was like, why? Like, she's like, I'm into short guys, I guess. You know, anyway, but, but it was a perspective I had that, man, I'm like, I mean, we're right, Top Gun, right? Like, but yet it was wrong. And see, in the kingdom of God, there's a perspective that really shifts maybe how you were raised and how you think. And Jesus says, no, the kingdom thinks this way. And so if we picked up in Matthew, the 20th chapter, I'm preaching really good today. Matthew, the 20th chapter, the first verse, at least it came across better than the, y'all booed me. So I appreciate that. Y'all can boo me on Facebook as well. <laughs> verse one, it says this, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with his laborers for a denarii, that's uh, just like a day's labor uh, or a day's wages, denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard, and he went out about, uh, about the third hour, which is about 9 a.m., and saw others standing idle at Home Depot, or you could say the marketplace, right? <laughs> just trying to make it relevant. Verse 4, and said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. And again, he went out about the sixth hour, which is noon, noon, and the ninth hour, which is about 3 p.m., and did likewise. In verse 6, it says, And about the eleventh hour, which is 5 p.m., he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why haven't you been, uh, why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. Verse 8, so when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those uh, came who were hired about the 11th hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner. 
saying, The last men have only worked one hour, and you made them equal to us, and have borne the burden of the, the heat of the day. I guess it was Texas, man. They're just mad as hornets now. Verse 13, But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to the last man the same as you. Is it not lawful, lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now, I don't know about you, but this goes roughshod against my own reason. This is completely foreign to how I've been raised. I feel like if I work hard enough, I should get paid, compensated that way. And if someone works less than me, they definitely shouldn't earn as much as me. Y'all know what I'm saying here today? And so it's interesting that Jesus says in the kingdom, it's completely opposite. And it's, and it's by his grace that he rewards us. It's by his mercy. It's not necessarily by how long we have worked. And so, I, I, I don't know about you, but I needed to unpack this parable and, and, and really kind of chew at it a little bit so that I can understand what Jesus is saying here. Because, it, again, it's just kinda, it, it just kind of goes against my grain. And so I'm going to... I'm going to give you my objections. I don't know if they're your objections. Like maybe you go, you're like, I already know I'm good with this parable. And, and great, I'm glad you're here. Uh, just amen kind of midway through and, and we'll be good. But, but I want to give you where I have seen this kind of challenge my own mentality. Is that okay? And so the first thing that really uh, uh, just completely strikes me as odd is that there is zero unemployment rate in the kingdom of God. Let me say it again. There's a zero percent unemployment rate in the kingdom of God. Again, I'm not talking politics. I'm not red. I'm not blue. I'm just talking about the kingdom. There's a zero percent unemployment rate in the kingdom of God. Now, why is that exciting? Because he's looking to hire you. And so what I discover in my own mentality is a lot of times I'm praying for revival. A lot of times I'm praying for the harvest. A lot of times I'm praying for more people to come to my ministry. But that's not what Jesus is desiring. He's actually praying in a different way. We see this in Luke, the 10th chapter. When he sends out the 70, he doesn't say pray for revival, pray that people will receive the message. He says pray for more laborers. Okay, since nobody amen me, let's look in your own Bibles. Luke, the 10th chapter. Luke, the, I was going to look there anyway. It's already set up. But Luke, the 10th chapter, it says this in the first verse. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Now watch verse 2. It's very important. Then he said to them, the harvest is, uh, truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray for what? Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So God is looking for laborers. Why is this exciting? I, I remember I was coming home from Lakewood. I was in uh, riding home with my father and I just began to weep uncontrollably. We stopped um, in Clear Lake City Boulevard. There was a Krispy Kreme. Uh, we stopped there before he dropped me off. And he just asked, what's going on? Why are, why are you struggling right now? What, what is it? And I said, Dad, I, I, I'm hanging around all these young adults. And every one of them is called to ministry. How is God going to have a place for me? What was the mentality that I had? I believed that ministry was finite that the world has a limited amount of resources, that if it all gets used up, will there, any, will there be anything left for me? And that is a worldly mentality, isn't it? It's the rat race of trying to get your own and guard your castle. Yet in the kingdom of God, we worship a God that's not finite but infinite. 
a God that, that has a predestined plan for your life, has before the foundations of the world orchestrated exactly what he desires for you to do, and there is a 0% unemployment rate in the kingdom of God. When you begin to grab that mentality, you no longer are trying to wait for some big break for ministry to happen, but you realize that life is ministry and that you get to wake up every day and live for Jesus. When I started to realize that with my own mentality, that life is ministry and that when I wake up my, my first ministry to my wife and to my children, that, that that's a ministry, that when I go to Randall's and walk Walmart, that's a ministry. I, I tell my church this all the time because I talk to so many of you. You're like, I feel this call to ministry. And I'm like, yeah, because the Lord's calling all of us, right? But until I decided to pray for more sick people at Walmart, God chose to not to expand my sphere of influence. When I pastored for five to six years, this right here, right here in the center was the congregation to its fullness. We counted pregnant ladies twice. If you were a little bit bigger, we counted you three times because we thought it was twins, right? And I got a boo on the nine. Y'all didn't boo me on that one. Praise God. Don't boo me on Facebook, please. But, but here's the beautiful thing. When I stop complaining to God, God, why, why is my ministry growing? Why aren't you doing anything? And I started going to Walmart and saying, Jesus, who do you want me to touch here? Then he began to expand my sphere of influence. Uh, we have a bass player. Awesome. So grateful you're here. Amen. Let me tell you something about our bass player. I didn't meet her coming to our church and, and saying, hey, glad you're here. We, we truly met by the Spirit in Randall's, right? And I'm singing in produce. I'm like, Jesus is amazing. You know, I don't know what I'm singing. Maybe Veggie Tales or something like that. And um, i got toddlers <laughs> talking with Larry and Tom. Anyway, so, uh, but... I'm in Randall singing a jam to Jesus because I don't need Sunday morning to sing praise songs to God, right? I get to sing praise to him and do ministry to him anywhere I go. I'm in produce. I, she says, uh, uh, Tina looks at me and says, you like to sing? I said, yeah, I love to sing to Jesus. And then the Lord began to speak to me about Tina. And he said, tell her I love it when she plays every note. She's, she's helped correct my sermon to get exactly what I said that moment because she knows exactly what I said because it profoundly hit her heart in that moment. Because I'm just getting produce. I don't think much of it. I get my food. I go home. But she says it hits her so hard because she's only playing in bars. How can God love every note that I play when I don't, I, I'm not playing Christian music. I'm just playing in bars. How, how do you love it? Because God doesn't see a bar player. God doesn't see your sin. God sees a potential daughter in the kingdom of God. He sees the harvest. And too often we're, we're wanting some public pulpit Instead of getting on our knees and saying, God, what do you want me to do today? Who is the one that you want me to reach? Because the harvest is out there. And when I lived that life, I love it. Tina shows up the next uh, uh, Sunday with bass in hand, ready to play. And I'm like, oh, what do we do, right? But, but either I'm prophetic or I'm pathetic. Either I heard God or I didn't. And God said he loved it when she played. And while her life wasn't perfect, there was hunger, there was humility, and he was seeing her heart. And it's in that place, my friends, that she changed. She transformed. Her life is not the same. And you're still growing. I'm still growing. We're all growing. But we're going after this thing called the gospel. And the harvest is plenty. My question is, are you going to join the ranks or are you going to be like the man that buried his talent and say, I'm waiting for my big break. That's when I'll do ministry. That's when I'll do my calling, when the Lord, I know the Lord's called me to own my own business, but I can't work at McDonald's right now. I'm waiting for my, and what you're doing is you're burying your talent, and you're, you're never going to experience God's goodness, because if you don't use it, you will lose it. Freely I have given, freely you've received, right? Give that back out. And when you live that way, there's multiplication that happens in your heart, because in the kingdom of God, there's 0% unemployment. The last thing that I just on subtopic on this point of 0% unemployment, I love that Jesus goes back or the landowner goes back and he still continues to keep hiring. Yeah. 
Now, what's amazing about that, uh, I, I worked for my dad when he, there was a time that he, he sold water softeners a, a good portion of growing up, but he decided to run his own business and sell his own water softeners, and so he hired me to help put them in, and so really what that meant is I was a ditch digger, and, and he would go to Home Depot or Lowe's, and he would grab another ditch digger to work alongside me. Now, when he picked a ditch digger in the morning, he tried to pick the ones that he thought could work really well, Right? He didn't get the weak ones. He didn't get the, even though he picked me, but he got the, the other, the, the, the one he picked, he picked a strong one. And, and that's what we do in the world, right? We are trying to pick the ones that are most talented, the ones that look the best, the ones that are, are probably tall, right? And not, not against you tall people, but still, the Lord loves short people. No, um, <laughs> the Lord loves the weak and the lowly and the rejected. I don't know where you're at in life right now. Maybe you're in debt and you're distressed. Maybe you're depressed. God loves you and wants you. And he is willing to pick you on his team. Maybe you've gotten passed over by everybody in life. Your parents said you weren't going to do well. Maybe teachers said you weren't going to do well. Maybe you're still sitting there waiting for somebody to pick you at the 11th hour. But my friends, Jesus wants you. There was a 0% unemployment rate in the kingdom of God. When you understand that, when you get a revelation that God wants you on his team, it changes who you are. I, I love this. There's a story of a minister. His name's Reinhard Bunke. And Reinhard Bunke tells about, it. now if you don't know about his ministry, millions, millions of documented people giving their heart to Jesus under his ministry. But what he says growing up, that his father favored the old, his older brother over him for ministry. He said, he's the smarter guy. He's going to be able to do ministry. Reinhardt, you're not that smart. You're not that good. I don't think you're going to be as good in ministry. Yet God chose the weak. God chose the ones that don't look educated. God loves that. And see, my friends, that's what's amazing. I don't, I don't know where, maybe you got it all in a bag of chips, but, but maybe you're like me and you ain't got it all together. And God says, I can still use that one. If they would just, and here's the key, they were just willing to work. Did you notice that? We wanted to get picked, but nobody picked us. But they were willing to work. And if you are just willing to go to the Walmarts, if you're just willing to say, let me pray here. If you're just willing to tell your uncle about Jesus, God says, I can use that one. I can multiply what they're doing. It just seems like fish and loaves right now, but I want to use them to a greater degree if they would just put what they got to work right now. Y'all okay? Y'all want to keep going? Y'all seem a little bit hungry. I don't know if y'all just more awake than the 9 a.m., a little hungrier here. <laughs> Tina's like, I've been here all day. I'm hoping for a 1 o'clock service right now. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, the, the, the second thing that we see here is in this story that when Jesus lines up the 11-hour workers, he pays them a denarius, and the guys that started at 6 a.m., they started first, they're thinking in their own minds, they're like, well, if they're getting a whole denarius, then what am I going to get? Like, I'm probably getting two, three. I mean, we do multiplication. I'm getting 12 denarius a day. Like, this is going to be amazing. And yet when they show up to get their denarius, they only get one. And they're taken back because their expectations did not get met. And Jesus says in that moment, why are you comparing yourself to somebody else? If I want to be generous with them, that's my business. That's my money. Uh, we agreed to a certain wage. Why aren't you okay with that? Yeah. And see, what I have discovered is if you, if you compare, you tend to complain. But if you praise, you will partake. Yeah. If you compare, it leads to complaining. But if you praise, you will partake. Let me, let me show you how the wisdom of the world differs from the wisdom of God. If we were to look at James the third chapter, James the third chapter, the 13th verse, it says this. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show his good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Verse 14. But if you have bitter envy, that means you're jealous, comparing to somebody else, you're not happy with what you got, and self-seeking... In your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom. Now, if you have a paper Bible, I would love for you to underline this because he says it's a wisdom. That means there's a reasoning that can get you to this point. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, 
sensual. Now, when he uses that word sensual, it doesn't mean sexual. It means a person that's sense-driven. That means you're driven by what you feel, taste. You wake up and you feel bad, so you're having a bad day. Or maybe even your reasoning leads you to a dark place. You're sensual and, oh, James, man, you're throwing it down, man, preaching hardcore today. Demonic, meaning you think like a demon. Verse 16, and demons do exist. I'll just throw that out there. Verse 16, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. I want to I hold up here for a second. Notice he compares two types of wisdom. There's a wisdom of the earth, wisdom of demons, very sensual, earthly, demonic, and then there's a wisdom from above. And the comparison here is that you're envious, you're self-seeking, you tend to compare yourself to what somebody else has, and through that comparison, it leads to you complaining. All right, let me, let me, we're going to, can I chew on this bone a little bit for a second? All right, so uh, I, I got here in two, December 2010. And there was another pastor. He's a little bit younger than me, but not as good looking as me. And uh, got here about the same time. His church, his ministry exploded. Like, just amazing what God was doing. He'd take an Easter picture, like a thousand people there. And I'm looking at it on Facebook like, uh, uh. Now, you know, I'm not, I'm not telling everybody about this. But, but inside, I'm struggling. I'm jealous. I'm comparing myself. And what are the things that come out of that? God, why aren't you working like that in my ministry? Right? Why aren't you, why aren't you, why, why aren't you doing it for me? I'm, I'm preaching the gospel, Jesus. I, I came here too. I love you, Jesus, right? And I remember getting up in one of my prayer times. I'm just praying, just you know, loving the Lord, singing my song. And as I'm just worshiping God, the Lord speaks to me. He says, you're jealous. I said, Lord, what are you talking about? He says, you're jealous of that man's ministry. I said, Lord, no, I'm not. Like, you're going to argue with the Lord. Like, what? I'm <laughs> sad, right? says, you're jealous. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to write him a check every month to his ministry. I said, Lord, right? He's got a bigger ministry. More money's coming in his ministry. His, his ministry should write to my ministry, right? Worldly wisdom. Same idea Judas, right? When, when the woman pours the alabaster over, Ju- uh, over Jesus' feet, then what does Judas say? Shouldn't this money been taken and given to the poor? Isn't that what all the news media says about ministries? Why aren't you giving much to the poor, right? Same mindset of Judas, same mindset of the world. Jesus had to break me of that mindset. Y'all okay today? I'm going to chew on this a little bit now. So I began to give to his ministry monthly, and what I discovered is that God began to work on my heart through that work of righteousness. He began to work on my heart and change it where I would stop comparing and competing with what someone else was doing and I would rejoice in it. Uh, again, I, I got I got I got to dig a little bit. See, because when you complain, what you do is you take off the camouflage that God has given you, the 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 suit of love, which is called the bond of perfe- perfection. When you take that off, you are telling the enemy that life is about me. Like when I was in the military, we wore camouflage. Why did we wear camouflage? So that we would not be seen by the enemy, right? And see, what you're doing is when you take off that, when you say, you know what, I can't believe you, why, why is this, why is that? And you complain, what you're saying is life is about me. Satan, I want you to do every evil work to me. You're creating place for the devil. That's why James writes there that in this type of thinking is every evil work. It happens when you compare and complain. Jesus says to those guys in the parable, why do you have an evil eye? Because they had got into that place of comparison. Y'all okay? But see, then there's this beautiful place in the kingdom that if you praise in it, you can partake in it. Are we okay? Can I I really want to dig into this a bit. So what do I mean by when you praise in it, you partake in it? I got to... I got to kind of lay a foundation here because when I first heard this, I never really heard scriptures that kind of backed it up. In fact, Chuck uh, Kalazeski, who comes and he's a prophet uh, over our ministry, one of the elders on the board here, uh, he said this. He says that when he prophesies over somebody, that that uh, when he speaks to them, there's a splinter effect that 
it, while they, I, I may be speaking to Mary as a, in a prophetic voice from God, but it can splinter off and touch the people in the service, even by Facebook, right? It can touch the people in the service. And, and I didn't get that because he would prophesy over an individual. And then, of course, everybody else is like, well, God, you got a word for me? Like, I, I need a word for me. Why, why? And, and, of course, God's not speaking to everybody individually like that, but he's saying that it could splinter off and get to you. And I, I didn't quite get that, that I was like, well, God, God you got to show me that. I, I, I've heard that if you praise in it, you partake in it, but i got, I got to see a verse. And then that's when the Lord took me to Psalms, the 34th chapter. Psalms, the 34th chapter, it says this. Bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So it's, when do we bless the Lord? Only when we get coffee? All times, right? Watch this verse 2. My soul shall make its boast, that means declare its testimonies, declare its goodness, boast in the Lord. Watch this. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Verse 3, O magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name. Did y'all see that there? Maybe you missed. Go back to that second verse. Maybe you missed it. Maybe you missed it. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. Watch, it's right there. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. When someone gets blessed, when God pours out his favor on somebody, when somebody gets a word and you praise in it, you get excited about it. It shows the humility of your heart. And see, I love this. Maybe, maybe you haven't read the script, scriptures enough, but there's a scripture quoted quite a few times, twice in the New Testament. It's this, that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, so that you understand what grace is, it's more than just forgiveness of sins. Grace is the divine ability to walk out what Jesus has called you to be. And so when you praise in what God has done in someone else's life, God now gives the grace to you to receive the blessing that they had received. Okay, um, um, so, so you're just following along with me. Have you ever come to something where you feel like God's called you to something bigger, but yet you feel like you're not big enough to do it? Uh, let me, let me, like, have you ever felt like your calling was not as great as the anointing on your life? What do I mean by anointing? The anointing that breaks the yoke, it gets through the burden, it, it, it's, the, it's the thing, it's the presence of God that brings breakthrough. Have you ever in your life felt like God called you to something that's amazing and awesome, yet when you pursued after it, when you tried to reach it, it seemed like there was too many roadblocks, too many stops, like, like, like why can't I get that? And, and see, what, what's, what really is taking place is God is wanting you to learn how to partake of what other people have done in life, maybe they've reached it and reached what God's calling you to. When you praise in what God's done, the anointing that was upon them will flow to you. All right, so uh, I, I'm going to reveal a little bit of my heart. Please don't judge me. But when my grandfather was here, I praised him a lot. I honored him a lot with my lips for five years, but I really didn't honor him with my heart. What do I mean? I said, Paul, Paul, uh, I, I would get up here and say, Paul, Paul's amazing and grateful for what you've done. I'm the pastor. I did it every Sunday. But yet in my heart, I said, man, he's washed up in ministry. He doesn't really know what he's doing. God's doing a new thing. I'd even make it spiritual, right? And, and here's the thing. My ministry never grew until I realized that the anointing was on, that was on his life when I praised him for it, when I honored him for it, would flow down to my life. And when I, when I kind of had this uh, growing moment, I call it even a rededication moment in 2016, began to seek the Lord, God began to deal with me about the honor that I had for my grandfather, and I, I began to change my perspective, change not just my words, but change my heart towards him. I love it because when Dan Moeller came, he came uh, to us in about February 2017. If you don't know who he is, he's our counseling pastor. If you have a marriage issue, I'm going to send you a video by Dan Moeller of how you need to die. But uh, he's our counseling pastor here at Church of the Living God. We just send you his YouTube videos. But because uh, he, he helps me. But what I thought was interesting is when he preached, 
He preached the same message of, of righteousness by faith that my grandfather teaches. And then to top it off, he said, and if you don't believe me, well, just wait till you get to heaven and I'll show you that I was right. And I said, come on. Maybe you don't know my grandfather. He says that all the time. I was like, what? Like he's, it's the exact same. And see, when God, I, I was able to get my eyes open to what God was doing and ministry expanded. So many things he had to reveal in my heart that I didn't think like he thought. But when I began to think like he did, and I began to, instead of getting jealous over what other people had, I began to praise in it. Humility hit my heart, and he could then raise me up when it was time. Yeah, y'all got that? Y'all like, I've clapped already, and you've, you've taken the nail, you've bent it over. Can we go on to a third point now, right? That's what y'all are saying, right? No, not at all. Pastor, we love you. All right, so we get back to this story, this parable in Matthew, the 20th chapter, and Jesus then pops off this statement. The last shall be first, and the first shall be last. Many are called, but few are chosen. And what I love about that is it shows that we see, we see popularity, we see prestige, we think anointing, favor, God doesn't look at it that way. God sees secret place. God sees people that no one ever will ever know on this earth. And God says, those are the people I love. They will be in the kingdom first, while those that thought they were first and they were honored here on earth will be last. We see this when, we, if we were to keep reading in Matthew, the 20th chapter, uh, one of the disciples' moms is like, Jesus, Jesus, you gotta, you gotta make sure that that my sons are on your right hand and your left. And moms are still doing that to this day. They're like, make sure my team, my my girls on first team, or make sure they're in the best education. Right? And moms are still doing that. But that that was happening in Jesus' day. Make sure the left and the right. And Jesus says, whoa, that's not that's not my privilege. That's the Father's privilege. But when the other disciples hear about that, they begin to argue amongst each other. Like, what are you trying to do? You're trying to take my seat right now. Like, I'm the best here. They they're arguing who's the best. Jesus breaks up the conversation and says, whoa, you got it all wrong. In the world system, by the world's mentality, bosses tell their employees what to do and they don't lift a finger. They're expected that, that the employees are to serve the boss. But in my kingdom, those that are serving will be the greatest. I've called you to serve. And see, here's the thing, that that now shifts our mentality that we're no longer walking in this place of trying to get our own way, trying to be first, but we now have to step back and say, God, it's not about me, but it's about you. And I'm willing to submit myself one to another to other people so that I can serve them. How do we do that? Because that does not come naturally. I don't know about you, but I've, natu I've never naturally wanted to come in second place, right? Most of us think like Ricky Bobby, which is, if you're not first, you last. Mm. Some of y'all too sanctified to know that movie. That's good. I'm not asking you to, don't Google it, all right? Don't Google it. <laughs> you won't think much of me if you Google it. Anyway, so, so here's the thing, though, my friends, that how do we get that mentality to serve one another? And I think it, I think it best comes about when we get out of this law mentality of trying to earn our denarii, and we understand that we've been chosen by God. All right, I'm gonna, we're going to suck the marrow out this bone today, all right? So in James, the second chapter, James, the second chapter, before James kind of gets into the, the, the text that I want to read, he talks, he's, it's, James is really a pastoral book. It's, it's kind of written to leaders, pastors, things like that. But he talks to leaders and he says, hey, when, you, when you're running a church service, don't like have special seats for the rich people up front and tell the poor people, whoa, you can't come in. Like you sit on that, it, like you smell or something like that. No, he, James says, don't show partiality. God doesn't show partiality. Like, like open the place up. Let the rich and the poor sit together. Make it not about finances. Make it about those that love God, right? 
And just so you know, we don't live that way. I, it, God has dealt with my heart about a lot of those things. I won't, if you want to talk to me personally how that looks, I can share with you how I practice that. But most importantly, we honor the hungry. If you want a front row seat in this church, just show up early and we'll give you that front row seat. Amen? Because we honor the hungry here at this church, which is amazing. But then as he goes on, he's going to talk about how some people fall to partiality. And really, it's, it's not because they don't... It's not because they're bad people. It's just because they have a wrong mindset. In James, the second chapter, the eighth verse, it says this. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of it all. What? Verse 11, for he, he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, remember, Jesus, when he said, do not murder, he said, you call somebody a fool. You just pop off on Facebook. You've committed murder in your heart already, right? Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of Liberty. So he says, live by a different law, that law of freedom, that law of grace. Verse 13, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And here's the mentality that God has that we struggle with, is that mercy triumphs over judgment. We see this in Luke, the 15th chapter. There's a parable of the lost son. Maybe you know this story. Uh, and, and there's the prodigal son, but then there's the lost son. Let me explain this more, more in depth. The, the prodigal son, he says, I want half my inheritance right now. He goes off to a crazy, you know, it's like if he was in Galveston. He went to the mainland, that foreign place, right? I love you if you're a mainlander. We, we love you. But, but he goes off, he, he spends it on harlots and crazy living. There's a famine or a recession that hits the land. He finds himself without money. Of course, when you run out of money, you run out of friends. And he's down on his luck. He says, man, I just need to go and serve my father. Like, if I just go home, tell dad I messed up, I can serve him. I'll at least eat better, better than I'm eating right now. Well, on his way home, maybe you know this story. Father sees him from a distance, runs after him. He says, shh, don't speak, right? He gives one of those rom-com moments. And and. It, he says, my son who was lost is now found, is dead, is now alive. He says, don't worry, it's not about being a servant. Your son takes the ring off, gives it to him, takes his robe off, puts it on him. He says, kill the fatty calf, call up Domino's. We about to have a party. We're going to do the rave cave, right? No, can I do that? No, probably not. And so, so here's the beautiful thing, my friend. They're partying on the dance floor. The father's completely forgiven. I don't know. Dad's probably just doing a jig. I don't know if it's 15 minutes later. I don't know if it's an hour later. What's going on? But dad's excited about this. But yet the lost son, the lost son's on the outside saying, what's all this music? Why this party? Well, your brother's back home. My brother. You mean that guy that squandered the money? Like, why, why are we throwing a party for him? He goes in. He talks to his dad. He says, dad, I've worked for you, and you've never killed a fatted calf for me. And then we realize how the son who's been there the whole time, working, ministering, he's, if, if I were to put it in our context, he's the churchgoer, right? He's the one that knows the scriptures, yet he doesn't know the heart of God. And he doesn't see that mercy triumphs over judgment. And it's because of this he says things like, you've never killed a fatted calf for me. You'll hear people, that God's not blessing me. Or they think that they have to try to earn a blessing. Well, it's conditional. i got to do these things to get God's blessing. When Ephesians, the first chapter, says that you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. You say, well, that's because we earned it. No, Ephesians will go on to say that he chose you before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless, to be in the beloved. He did that for you. And see, here's the, here's the thing of a mentality of a person that's trying to earn God's favor and earn God's grace. They're always looking to the left and the right. They're always comparing. They're always wondering why blessings aren't coming to them. But those that understand a justification by faith, those that truly understand that it's only God that can make you right, discover that they've been chosen by Him. 
you know, I was, uh, uh, I told you that moment I had with my dad in the car. There was another moment because the Lord kept dealing with me this. And I, I was coming out of a service in Liberty, Texas. It was after I rededicated my life in 2001. And the Lord's speaking to my heart. And the minister that day had spoken this verse. I'm not sure if it was in Matthew, the 20th chapter. That's also found after the parable of the uh, invitation to the wedding in Matthew, the 22nd chapter. But it's that verse that many are called, but few are chosen. And, and I'm coming out of that church service. And the Lord's dealing with me. He's like, I'm calling you to ministry. I want you to preach my gospel. And I'm like, uh, Lord, what are you talking about, Lord? Because even your word says that many are called, but few are chosen. And I kind of like threw it back at the Lord like, oh, yeah, but you're calling everybody and only selecting a few. And when I said that to the Lord, he spoke to me very clearly. He said, stop saying that. I want you to say that many are called, but I am chosen. And what was the Lord doing in that moment? He was teaching me how to access the promises of God by faith. That you are truly chosen by God. You have to go from this world, oh yeah, he loves everybody, to man, he's after my heart. I was in um, healthy Chinese, it used to be called healthy Chinese, I don't know why. They called it Healthy Chinese Buffet. That's uh, anyway. But, but I was in Healthy Chinese on a Sunday, and there was another guy there. And I just, again, I just minister. I just love all the time, right? I, 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 it's not a, I don't punch in the clock as a pastor and punch out like life's ministry for me. And so I'm in the Healthy Chinese, and I look at the guy, and I say, man, Jesus loves you. And he looks right back at me with a stone-cold face and says, yeah, he loves everybody. And see, what had happened he couldn't access that promise for himself personally. But see, we understand through uh, um, Malachi, uh, no, not Malachi, Habakkuk, that the just shall live by faith. Quoted throughout the New Testament three more times. That your justification, you're right with God, you're chosen by Him. And if you would believe that, you could receive that. You say, no, pastor, it, 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 there's, there's no way. Well, it's impossible if you're going to try to law mentality because James said if you miss any point of that, you're guilty of the whole thing. Like you miss any one of the laws. And, and, and we could go through the dietary laws. I mean, we're shrimp eating people up here in Galveston, right? We could go through the dietary laws. We could look at the clothes that you're wearing. Maybe you ain't wearing 100% pure cotton, right? We could go down the law and see how we're missing it or we could choose to live by faith and say, God, I can't make myself right. Only you can. And when you begin to believe it, what happens in your heart is your speech, James says, and your actions no longer judge other people, but they're full of mercy. It's 1224. I said 1225, but I got one more story. Is it okay? That was like one-third of you. I was hoping for one half. The, if if y'all on Facebook could make up that other uh, with that. Father, we just thank you. So um, my grandfather, uh, many of you know his heart and, and how he loves Jesus. Well, he, he was here pastoring, and there was a guy that was convicted of murder and pedophilia. And my grandfather found himself right in the dab square middle of this drama here in Galveston. And, and why I say he was in the middle of it is because they asked my grandfather to do the funeral for this man, uh, uh, the funeral for this young boy who had been uh, just horrific, just horrific crimes against him. And when he showed up to the funeral, obviously everybody was in hysteria and crying, and uh, it, it was just tense, and yet the Lord spoke to my grandfather that they don't need to cry out for justice. They need to ask for mercy for this uh, convict. And so my grandfather, when he delivers that message, you can, I mean, it goes over like a lead balloon, right? It's just like, whoa, like, because everybody there, they wanted justice. They wanted, it's got to be served, right? I need, I, I, I need revenge on this. And yet my grandfather felt the heart of God to extend mercy to someone who didn't deserve mercy. When he preached that sermon, of course, um, it wasn't a people-pleasing sermon, but it was what God was saying. 
he also got the opportunity, because he's the chaplain of the jail, to go meet that man in prison. And when he went to meet the man in prison, instead of saying, man, you messed up, you're wrong, he just shared about a Jesus that forgives sins. And that man gave his heart to the Lord while he was in prison. Who else could go but a man that knows mercy? My grandfather walking in what God had given him. My grandfather's going to see that guy in heaven one day because when he went into prison, there's prison rules and, and he got murdered in prison for what he committed. But yet, God didn't see a pedophile. God didn't see a murderer. God saw a potential son in the kingdom. My question is, do you see that? Because if we don't see that, then we're not thinking like Jesus. And if we're not thinking like Jesus, who does James say we're thinking like? We all bow our heads together today. You know, uh, um, normally I give you an opportunity to know Jesus, but today I'm, I'm feeling a different call. I'm feeling a call to repentance. Repentance simply means in the Greek to change the way you think. Many of us, we, we, we want justice when God's crying out for mercy. We want to be first. God's crying out for you to be last. We want to get paid when God's saying be generous. And so I don't know where you're at, but I know God wants us to think like the kingdom. He wants us to be full of mercy because mercy triumphs over judgment. That we'd stop looking at other people and murdering them in our hearts through our words and our actions but we would be full of forgiveness full of his goodness that's you today and you say pastor I, I haven't thought right I, I've thought with the world's mentality and you say today I want to repent today's your day that you just raise your hand high in there I want to pray with you amen I see all those hands Come on, don't let this, it's, it's a natural way of thinking, but we, wanna, we don't want to think natural, we want to think heavenly. Oh God, you're so merciful. So merciful. Father, you see all those hands, God. You see the hands on Facebook. If you're on Facebook and you want to you wanna repent, you want to think like the kingdom, just put think like the kingdom in the comments. Father, you see all of us, we want to, I even repent, God. I want to think like the kingdom. God, your heart is for the harvest and you're calling us as laborers. We need to stop judging God, but we need to go out and we need to reach people with your heart of mercy, your heart of love, God. So I ask right now, by your grace, you would change the way we think. That we would stop living by the law, God, but we would live by liberty. We would live in freedom. And Father, we would extend that freedom to others, even if they've hurt us. We thank you for this, God. Thank you for changing our mindset. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name. And the people of God said, amen, amen. If I can have Denzel and the band come back and... If we can stand to our feet, I, I, I want to just worship uh, one more time. Um, just just want to worship. Hallelujah. I really felt like worship was going to seal what God is doing in this season through our church. Many of you have raised your hands and said, man, that's, that's me. I, I, I raised my hands now twice today. That's me. I've thought wrong. I've thought with, man, if I just do enough, God will bless me. Instead of saying, God, how can I, 
How can I just live in grace? And so I just want to, if we can sing and worship, if that's okay today, if you can turn the lights down just a hair, thank you again. And, uh, and just worship the Lord in this moment. Just praise Him. He is for you. He's not against you. I know some of you are probably saying, Pastor, you said 12, 25, but I'm not in charge of the service. I'm not in charge. His presence is so real. So we're just going to worship the Lord. Can you sing uh, just that bridge on uh, No Longer Slaves? Because I feel like God wants to do something in our midst. You know, Jesus says in John, the fourth chapter, that true worshipers will worship him in spirit and in truth. Truth was revealed to us today. The Holy Spirit is present. He's just looking for a humble heart, a heart that wants to praise in what he's doing. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your goodness, God. Just honor him today. Honor him with your heart. Honor him with your lips. We praise you, God. We worship you today, God.
He humbled himself, God. God, we don't have to get our own way. We don't have to, to prove we're right, God. God, you have made us right through the blood. So I thank you for your mercy, God. It's mercy extended to others, God. Father, that we would go into the highways and the byways, God. We would grab the sinners, those that are gone, those that are lost. Pray for the sick at Walmart, God. We would go after the harvest, Jesus. Because there's a 0% unemployment rate in your kingdom, God. So we thank you for these things. We praise you. In Jesus' name I pray and the people of God said, Amen, Amen. God bless you.